Glory to God. You know, I want you to know something. The glory of the Lord is on you today. The glory of the Lord is here to overshadow you today, to change you today, to transform you into, a, into his, to the image of Christ. Not just inside y'all, but all the way through you. All the way around you. The, the anointing is on you to break every yoke today. To set the captive free. To open prison doors. To break the chains to those that are bound today in your homes. To loose them. And set them free. To anoint them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet so that they can be changed. From glory to glory, from faith to faith. And you can call those things today that are not as though they are. You can bind the strong man in your family today if you want to walk out of here changed. If you want to walk out of here in the provision of God. The title of the message today is called The Torn Veil. And I want to talk to you today about why Jesus had to become king in order for the veil to be torn. And why Jesus wanted the veil to be torn today so that you could experience the same authority, not just the presence of the Father, not just fellowship with the Father, not just God walking you in the cool, in the cool of the day, Marilyn, but, God's, but in you and through you and around you, the glory of God, Pam, would be with you. Not just for a momentary time, but all the days of your life. And that you would literally, Gina, experience the authority, Wayne, and the power of God in your life just like Jesus did when he walked on the face of the earth. That you would literally walk in the same glory, the same kingdom authority, the same phenomenal signs and wonders and miracles, Austin, would occur in your life. Just like, they, just like they did in the life of Jesus. And all we got to do today is follow the, the same kingdom principles, the same process that Jesus walked in that, that you do, that, 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 that Jesus walked in that we can walk in today. Now, I said to the torn veil, but I could have said, I could have said, Thy kingdom come. I could have said, Establishing thy kingdom come. The tearing of the veil. The redemption and, and, and the glory of God. So God, that, that's why Jesus came. Why did Jesus become, why, what does Jesus and the tearing of the veil, what is, I mean, we know that part. Why did Jesus, why did the veil have to be torn? So that we'd be brought, the Bible says, so that we'd be reconciled, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. That we'd be reconciled, brought back into fellowship with the Father. And that we would what? Have the ministry of reconciliation. But in order to have the ministry of reconciliation, David, you've got to have what? You've got to have the same power. Everybody say power. The same power, the same authority, the same, the same privilege that Jesus had, the same kingdom that Jesus walked in on the face of the earth. You've got to have the same, same kingdom authority that he did when he walked on the face of the earth. That's why Jesus became king. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke the 19th chapter. And I'm going to show you a different tone of people today. The reason, when, in Jesus' trial, and we've talked about Jesus' authority, how he, received, how he received the donkey and the goat, or the colt. And we talked about the binding and loosening. We talked about Jesus coming into, into Jerusalem and being anointed a king, we, about him becoming the king of the Jews. We also talked about him using his kingly authority to do what? To, 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 to force not only the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but the Roman government through fear, to, and we'll talk about that later on, but to, to call, through fear to crucify him on purpose. And I call it the brilliance of Christ. But today, I want to talk to you about the, 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 one of the main reasons that Jesus came to, to establish himself as king was to make sure that his kingdom was established here on earth for you and for me before he left this world. So that we could have the very... That's why he told the disciples. He said, Lord, teach us how to pray, right? And he, so he said to them, Dave, he said, well, pray this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For exalt God. Lift him up. Acknowledge his authority in your life. Acknowledge your desire for him. Acknowledge that, as you said just earlier, Pam, that he's the treasure of our heart. That where a man's treasure is, there his heart is also. That you're in love with him. 
that he's your first love, your only, your truest love. Acknowledge him today. It's, it's Luke chapter 19. We're going to start at verse 37. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge the, the, the all power, if I say all power, all belongs power. to God. And then and James says that every good and every perfect gift does what? Comes from the Father of lights where there is no shadow or turning. So why did Jesus, let me, let me read this first. Uh, so, so you want to see the reason why the people, Jesus was smart. He knows why they're following him. He knows what they want. It's the same thing he did when he fed the 5,000 and he fed the 4,000, David. He pulled, he pulled the disciples aside and he said, listen. He said, will you also go away when what? When the fishes and the loaves are gone? What do we all need in our life right now? What do you want more than anything else? You, you need a miracle. You need, sign, you need miracles in your life. You need signs and wonders. You need the authority of God in your life. You need, you need, you need God to work in your life and transform and do what? Rebuke the devourer for your sake, don't you? You need God to you need to God, you need God to drive away the forces of darkness that try to come against you. You need God to destroy your enemies, don't you? You need God to, to remove the weight and the debt that's on the back of your shoulders right now and so that you can what? Him that the Lord makes free is free indeed. Uh, free indeed. You need the authority of God to, to, to bring joy inside of you that's unspeakable and full of glory. You want God's peace. You want God's mercy. You, want God, you, you, want to, you actually want to be free from the cares of life. Luke chapter 19. You want to be free from the cares of life. Him that the Lord what makes free is free indeed. You want to see God actually operate in your life. You're tired of being drugged down, aren't you? You're tired. You, you, you want to be able to do what, David? Lay aside the weight. You want to, uh, and every sin that he lets beset you. You're tired of setbacks, aren't you? You're tired of taking three steps forward and ten steps back. Aren't you? You're ready to do what? You're ready to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Not just provision. Not just protection, not just, not just Jesus doing miracles and signs and what, not just outward manifestations of the glory of God in your life. You want to see God's power work in you and in you and through you and around you. That's the reason why. That's one thing's missing in the church today. That's what the power. Every, there's, I'm going to show you that there's two different baptisms. And you got to have both to survive. You got to have both. You got to have both to thrive. You don't. Just, you don't want to just get along. You want. You don't want to just survive. You want to thrive. We've been talking about what a good father did long a while back, didn't we, David? A good father lets you thrive instead of surviving. You want to. You want to rise up and be and, and walk in the fullness of God's glory, and be able to say inside your heart, "No weapons formed against me can prosper." And and any tongue, truly say it, any tongue that rises against me, I can condemn it. I can condemn it and say, go, in Jesus' name, and it goes. I can say, no, I can stretch forth my hand and, 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 and call those things that are not as though they are, and they begin to happen. And I, can, and I can call on the name of the Lord, and that is a strong tower, and I can run to it, I can feel safe in the arms of God. And every time I need my Savior, I lift him up, and there he is. That's what they were crying out for, a Savior. Not just one time. Not just, not just at the cross of Calvary alone. But every time that I need him, I stand still and I see the, I, I stand still and I do what? I see the salvation of God working in my life. How many times has God ever saved you? Every time I've ever called his name out. Every time I've ever needed him. Why? Because David said he's a what? He's a very present help in a time of need or trouble. I will not fear. I will not be afraid. Even though the ground itself begins to lose gravity and it crumbles underneath my feet, I won't worry about it all. And you know why? Because I'll stand underneath the wind of the, of the living God and, and, the, and the threshold of God will lift me up. When, when everything else falls apart and everything else is dismayed and everything else is destructed, destructive, I can turn my face to God like a flint and I know that I'll not be moved. I am anchored in Jehovah and I know shall not be moved. Just like a tree, I'm rooted and grounded in Him. Just like a tree, that's what David said. A tree planted by the waters. And I, I by the living waters of God. And I shall not be moved. My leaves shall never wither. And my fruit shall never fall to the ground. That's what kind of God you're looking for, aren't you? That's why Jesus had to come. That's what they wanted. Look what he says right here in verse 37. They said, and then as he drew, he's already on, he's already on the colt. They've already set him on the colt. And they've already put their clothes. Today, you know what you need to do? 
the reason why they put their clothes on that 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 um, that cult when Jesus got a cult, putting your clothes on it was a sign of submission. Everything that you had is His. Everything that you own is His. You're submitting to His authority. If you want God to be God in your life, then you got to submit to the authority of God through the Holy Ghost. You got to give it all over to Him. You know it doesn't matter because you know why Psalms 24 and one says this: the earth, it's, the earth is the Lord's and the world and all that dwells there. It's all His anyway. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills the cattle stand on. It's all, it's all his in the first place. Everything that's in this earth that has ever been created, God willed it. He willed it. He just willed it. He thought about it, and it came into existence. And then Jesus spoke it, because he's the word, right? That's how they work together in perfect harmony. Jesus spoke it, and then the Holy Ghost does what? He comes around, and he watches over it to perform it with wonders to perform. He watches over God's word. So he says... That, that as, as he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, what, everybody say the whole. The whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God. Why? And he tells you why. I've never seen this in all my years. He said, they, the whole disciples and, and multitude began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for what? Everybody say for all. For all the mighty works which they had seen. That's why they praised him. For all of the mighty works which they had seen. They, need, they needed some mighty works in their lives. All the mighty works which they had seen. Saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on earth. That's what you want. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees called out to him from the crowd. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what does Jesus say? Hallelujah. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if, you, if they should keep silent, if these should keep silent, that he, that's how great God is. That's what you want in your life. If these should keep silent, that even the stones would cry out and praise him. One place says even the trees of the field will clap his hand. Now turn over to John chapter 17. If you, you don't have to, but I, I'll just go ahead and read it to you. I want you to just mark it down, write it down. John 17, verse 16. And then Jesus says, Jesus is praying over them. He says, they are not in the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them with truth. Your word is truth. Verse 18. And as you sent me into this world, I have sent them into this world. Now, this, I want you to remember this, verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. That they also, I'm going to preach on that next week. I sanctify myself. So that also that they may be sanctified with truth. I do not pray for, for these alone, but I also will pray for everybody who believes in them through, through their word, believes in me through their word. That they all may be one, that you and I, if I say that we, that we all may be one as you, Father, are in me and as I am in you, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe you have sent me. So you've got to have the anointing. You've got to have the power of God in you so the world will know that God has sent him. It, you, nobody will know that God has sent Jesus unless we're all walking in the same, same authority, unless we're walking in the same will of God, unless we have the same kingdom power, the same kingdom principle, unless we have the same glory of the Lord shining around about us that shined around Jesus, unless the Holy Spirit is encompassing or in, around about us, then nobody's going to believe because they can't see. Why? Because they're in the natural they need to see the supernatural of God working in your life. And so he says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them. He's passing it on. Pass it, pay it forward, y'all. He's passing it on. Give it to the, he's, I have me, given me, I have given to them. That what? That they may be one just as you and I are one. See, God's, God's putting a oneness on us today. God's wanting us to be a, a one, a, a one mind and one accord, perfect perfect accord, one mind and one accord in perfect form and sync in, in the same glory, the same the same delight, that the same light that God walks in, he wants us to walk in the same light. The same wisdom, the same authority, the same power, the same anointing, the same presence, the same kingdom, principles, privileges that Jesus had when he walked under. He said, I'm giving it to y'all. I'm giving it all to y'all. And how did he establish that? By, come, by becoming king. By becoming, sure, of course, the son, he's an heir. Sure, of course, we know that Jesus, he came to shed his blood on Calvary. That's redemption. Remember I said it, the kingdom come, the tearing of the veil, redemption, and the glory. You can't have it. You can't have, you got to follow that process. You can't have one without the other. You got to follow. You got to first have the kingdom before you can have a tearing of the veil. 
Jesus had to come establish the kingdom so he could so he could create his authority here on earth. Where as being a king, not only could he take your place, not only could be an, he be an heir to the throne and a joint heir with Jesus, but through that kingdom authority, not only could he nail your sins to the cross and make you a brand new creation in him, they enter in Christ or a new creation, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. But then through, through that new creation, he can also release, David, his authority over you. He can also release his kingdom privileges, his kingdom power, his kingdom authority. Not just, not just giving, not just, not just protection, not just provision, not just, not just the accolades of heaven, not just the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but that heaven itself would operate in you and operate in me. So that the same power, everybody say same power. The same power, we just sang that song. The same power that raised Christ from the dead would dwell in us. And what does it do? It would quicken our body. So that our body would line, our body would come alive. See, the entire purpose of, of Jesus' kingdom coming is so that the veil would be torn. What does the veil represent, y'all? I know, I know I said rec reconciliation, being brought back into fellowship with God, but you know what, you, you know what the, you to bring me some paper in here, y'all. Because you're walking right there, and just give me a couple of those um, copy sheets of paper right there, it's real fast, I forgot to bring it in here. The veil represents what? The veil represents the flesh of man. The one, what, what keeps you and I away from God? The reason why God had to establish his kingdom principles is because he needed, to, he needed to give you and I the authority so that when the, when the, when the veil was torn, that we, could, that, we could, that we could actually be restored back into the original, the original place, the original innocence, the original uh, divine authority, the divine anointing of God, the original presence of God's glory in our life that Adam and Eve had when they were in the garden before, garden before they fell. That's the entire purpose of the cross of Calvary. It's so that the flesh can be destroyed. God bring his kingdom so the flesh can be torn, so that the flesh can be removed. And the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, and it says this. It says that so that we, that, that through, that we can go into the holiest of holies through the blood of Jesus. Jesus consecrated for us ourselves, what? A, a new veil. You know what that new veil was? A new veil that was his body. Thank you. A new veil... That was his body. The entire principle of God's word. The entire reason why God. It's not just, he wants to give you the authority. So that you can become innocent again. In the blood of Jesus. And also receive power. To be co. Co-authority. Co-authority in the kingdom. Not only in the kingdom of God. But your heirs with God and joint heirs with Jesus. Right? So you're co-authority. God's on the throne. You can't take that away from him. God's, God's, God will be lifted up when nobody else will be lifted up. But you have co-authority and co-power back on the earth again. That you actually can walk like Adam and Eve did on the face of the earth before they first fell in the garden of Eden. That they walked in innocence. God is ready to do what? He's ready to tear the veil. Tear the flesh. Tear the flesh and remove it and remove it and as he did with your sins and take, that's why he had to establish his kingdom so that Jesus could come and do the first works of Adam all over again. So he could destroy the power, the one thing that has power over you more than anything else, death, hell, and the grave. Destroy the power of the flesh. Destroy its authority over you. And we, every time it's torn, God removed its authority over you. And in the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20 says that you can go into the... Now, why do, you, why, why do you think you can go into the holiest of holies? Not just because, not only because, it is because, not because the blood of Jesus was cleansed you of all unrighteousness. Your, 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 your soul is cleansed, right, Marilyn? Your, your soul is redeemed. And your spirit man is cleansed and purified through the blood of Jesus. I'm going to get to this in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to get ahead. I want to get ahead of myself in the sanctification part. I'll get there in a second. Your soul is cleansed. But the one thing that's not cleansed is what? What's the one thing that's still corrupt and unfit for the kingdom of God? 
What's the one thing that betrayed God and that, that, that Adam and Eve used? You know there's only three sins in the Bible, right? Three major sins out of all the sins of the Bible. There's only three sins that, that, that they're categorized under. And, 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 and uh, Adam and Eve, Eve did them all. She even spoke them. The three sins are lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And they all deal with what? The indwelling sinful nature of the flesh. I've been talking about this to y'all for years. But the veil represents the flesh. The flesh has to be torn so what? So that God can bring us back to our original state of innocence in the Garden of Eden. But in a greater and more perfect way. That's why his kingdom had to come. Jesus had to establish his authority. He had to establish his kingdom on earth. And let his kingdom come so that what? So that God's will could be done on earth as it was in heaven. So he could have the power to do on earth. What, what he needed uh, to do on earth, what he needed to do to, to, to use in heaven. So he had that kingdom authority. The earth and heaven are separated. What separate? What separates the earth and heaven? That's why when man fell, God had to do what? He, actually, that was the pre Adamic era. But he had to, no, he did that too. After the, he did after the flood. So that, that they're separated with the, the the heavenlies, the third heaven. We're in the second heaven, and there's of course, and there's hell. He had to separate it. Used to, you could heaven and hell, they were one. They could see up and down. But when man fell, God had to separate it. Why? Because the flesh separated man from God. And, and, and God could no longer look on mankind. He could no longer look at him because if he looked at him, he would actually destroy him. So he had to do what? He had to create a what? He, 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 he didn't, it was always there. Sal, God's salvation plan was not a contingency plan, y'all. It was always the plan. He always knew man was going to fail. He always knew he was going to miss it. He always knew that it was, always, it was, it was going to come back to the Garden of Eden. It was going to come back to the original. But that, but that man himself could not do it on his own. Man himself in his own flesh would fail. Even Jesus said it in the Garden of Gethsemane, y'all. I'm going to show y'all something next week. It makes Jesus be, be my greater hero more than anything else that I ever, at all. Not just because he was the Son of God. Not just because all power belonged to him. But because he did it all as a man, I'm going to show y'all. I'm going to show y'all next week that he didn't cheat. I'm going to show y'all that he didn't that he didn't exempt himself from the process that I'm talking to you about today. The kingdom, the veil torn, Terry, the um, the redemption. You said, well, Jesus didn't have to be born again. I'm going to show you something. He, he didn't have any sin in him, but he was the first born again among many brethren. It says that in Romans 8:31. <laughs> he was. A, how did, I'll give y'all a nugget. Okay, where was he first? Where was he born again at David? To a virgin. He came up out of a virgin without sin. He was the first born again among many brethren. So he was born without sin. He was the first born again so that we could follow him. And so what, what why did he do that? He was literally, he was the first, he was the second Adam. God stripped himself of all of his authority and came on the earth as a man and walked as the second Adam. Why? So he could do all the first works over again. He had to establish his kingdom in order to do so. What was he doing? He needed to establish his kingdom. So that he could, so that through the cross, by going through the cross, but he was not only not only dying for our sins, but tearing the veil, tearing the flesh, oh, tearing the flesh, the veil being torn, the veil being torn was a tearing of the flesh, and when the flesh was torn, God was able to do what? You thought I forgot about it. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. It says in there that because of the blood of Jesus, because we have been cleansed of all unrighteousness, we can come into the holiest of holies. Why? Because it says in there that Jesus consecrated for us himself. He consecrated himself for us, what? A new veil. There's two veils. He consecrated a new veil. And it says that the veil is his flesh. In other words, what he did was, when, when man used to be in the Garden of Eden, man was innocent. Why? Of his flesh. You know why? Because he didn't know that he was naked. He, why, did, why did he not know he was naked? Because he was clothed in what? The embodiment of God. He was clothed in the glory of God through the Holy Spirit. He had all power. So, what, so I'm going to show you two different clothings today. The first one was Jesus. It, when Jesus went to the cross and he nailed our sins to the cross, he, I'm, I, might, I might repeat this again uh, uh, next week. But he clothed himself in the glory of God. When Jesus died on the cross, we died with him. Did you know that? Did you know, when you, did you, know you literally, Austin, were there when Jesus died on the cross? That's right. All of us were. He, Romans chapter 6 says this. It says that if we are baptized, 
You know, when you get born again, what's the first thing you do? You go get baptized in water. What is that water? What, what is baptism of water? It means immersion. It means it, bapt, it, it, baptizo means to be immersed, right? So you're actually immersing. You're actually you're actually just doing your works over again, saying what that I went that I died with Jesus in baptism and I was rose again through the resurrection of the power of the Holy Spirit. So I were baptized in Christ through His blood and washed clean and made holy, but we're also baptized in His death. We're also about, see, the body of death is done away with. It says that, that, that if we are buried with Christ in death, here's the great part about it, Tina. If we're buried with Christ, if we die with him in the flesh, and the flesh is torn, then we shall also, then, 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 then just as God resurrected Jesus from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit, it says that we shall also, too, walk in the newness of life. So what happened when we got born again and, and we were clothed in Christ, we were clothed in the embodiment of Christ, you know what happened? We all, all of a sudden, we, became, we literally became born again and became a new creation. Everything that was, the, the old man died, everything died in our life, all the past died, all of our flesh, all of our sins, everything went away from us and we felt, whew, we felt brand new. We felt washed. We felt clean. We felt holy. We felt free. We felt joy that was unspeakable and full of glory. We felt the newness of life. And so that's, what, that's why the veil has to be torn. That's why to, to remove the old flesh that was, that was corrupt, to bring us back to the original state that Adam and Eve were when they were innocent in the garden and they, they didn't know they were naked and they didn't have any sin. So, Brother King, can we live without sin? Absolutely you can. I'm going to show you that next week. Actually, I'll show you a little bit of it today. Uh, you absolutely can live without sin. You can walk with the same power. It's not just it's not just provisions. It's not just physical, materialistic provisions. It's not just um, it's not just physical provisions. It's spiritual and supernatural provisions that him that the Lord makes free is free. And that you can actually be clean. That's why he told Peter. He said that Peter. He said he said Peter. Whatever I make clean is clean. In other words, when I make you pure and holy, you are pure and holy. You're without, you're without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. And if you choose, choose you this day who you're going to serve. If you choose to, Gina, did you know what? That you can walk holy all the days of your life. And you don't, let me tell you all something. You don't, that's why, that's why the veil's torn. The, the flesh, it, it don't go away. It's still there, isn't it? It's still, you still have to deal with it. But, but, but you don't have any obligation to it any longer. You don't have to sin if you don't want to. You don't have to walk in the world if you don't want to. You don't have to let your flesh have its way with you if you don't want to. You, you have authority. I'm going to show you in a minute that you actually have authority over it. So that's why Jesus, that's why Jesus, first of all, came and died on the cross. That's, that's why the veil was torn the first time. But the veil is torn many times in your life. And so the veil brought redemption, didn't it? The veil, the veil brought us to a place where, that we were redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Though our sins were scarlet, they were made as white as snow. They were red like crimson. They're made as white as wool. So we are redeemed and made brand new in Jesus Christ. The word redeemed means you're built back up. You're brought back in. You're brought back into the fold. You, I, I, I was lost, but what? But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. But then the next, the next veil that had to be torn, the next veil comes, the next veil that had to be torn is the glory. So it's the kingdom Redempt, re, the kingdom, the veil, redemption, and the glory. What, well, what is the glory? The very thing you need more than anything else in your life today. The glory is the embodiment of God. The, and I'm going to explain it here in just a minute. I'm just going to give you a brief, brief definition. The glory of God, the embodiment of God is the Holy Spirit. What is missing in the house of God is the baptism. There's, there's, I'm going to tell you in a minute, there's two different baptisms. There's a baptism of Christ, and then there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can't make it without both. You've got to have them. You need them. To, you, need them. you don't want to just survive. You need them to thrive. One, one baptism is on the inside. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just stop right there. I'll tell you in just a second because I've got to explain it through sanctification. But the, baptism, but the glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of God is not just in you, y'all. What, what's, what's the one defective part about you that keeps leading you away? That's right. That's absolutely right, Marilyn. The flesh keeps leading you away. So 
that it's the only thing that cannot be redeemed. It's the only thing that cannot be restored. It's the only thing that cannot be renewed. So in order to bring it obey, bring it at bay, in order to stop it, Wayne, in order to make it mine, the only way you can make it mine is have a greater power and a greater authority in you. And I, and I, I did use, you said, well, does that mean, again, that you, that you said one time that God used, used trials and tribulations to bring it into subjection. No, those won't go away. But, you, but there's something else that brings it at bay that allows you to, that allows it to accommodate you, that allows you to overcome even the trials and tests of your life because then the trials and tests become what? Come on, Ken, what's the right word? I said it, I said it early in my spirit. The trials and tests become, um, ah, what's the word when you're working out? They become, I'll think of it in just a second. Come on, Holy Ghost. Controlled. They become your try instead of them instead of the enemy come in and, and, and waxing you like a dog and beating you to the ground and 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 and, and, and you feel and, and you feel coming in like a flood and you feel like you're overwhelmed and all, and, and, you're, you're, and all everything around you just is hitting you from the left and to the right and you feel like you're just beaten to a pulp. When you walk when you when you when you receive the glory of God through what through the embodiment of God, which is who? The Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes on, you're not just consumed on the inside, you're consumed on the outside. Because now you're baptized. When you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you actually go on and you come up and you come up in, in the fullness of God. And there is a barrier, there is an embodiment, there's a barrier around you that does what? This is what God said to me before I left, left the house, Wayne. He's, he said, when the devil tries to come in like a flood and he tries to burn your house down, he said, he said, the glory of God that's around you through my Holy Spirit, he allows you to stamp out the forest fires so you can take authority over the, over the force of darkness. You can bind the strong man through the glory of God and bind the principalities so they can't destroy your home and your family and your kids and everything around you is left safe. That you can actually live not only free from sin, but free from sickness and disease. Free from the attacks of the enemy. Free from the cares of life. Free from the attacks of those around you. That you can actually walk, that you can act, an entire church can walk in the fullness of God's glory and nobody gets sick and nobody die. And I told y'all that about one of Kenneth Hagin's church when, when this happened. For 11 years, nobody got sick, nobody died, no, no disease, no. See, see you got to realize something. When you're fighting spiritual authority, I'm going to get this another sermon down the road. When you're fighting spiritual you, everybody looks at sickness and sickness and diseases. It's our sickness is awesome. You're going to learn something today. Everybody looks at something. It's scientific or medical. It's not scientific. It's not medical, y'all. They might, God may have given men of the ability to, to, to draft and design these sickness, but you know where they come from? They don't come from their own, own vain thinking. The Bible says in Psalms 91, it says the arrows fly by day, that's a tax, by the way. And the pestilence, what is pestilence? Anybody know what pestilence is? Sickness and disease. Pestilence is disease. And then pestilence does what? It walks by night. You know what that means, Marilyn? It's a spirit. So you can't overcome and you can't defeat the attacks of, the, of, of things that are spiritual with fleshly things. I'm going to get to that next week, too. That your, your carnal weapon, your weapons of warfare are not carnal any longer, but they are mighty through God pulling down strongholds. You can't defeat all that. So when the people saw Jesus coming, they said, what, did you, what does Jesus want us to have? Why did Jesus establish his kingdom? Why did he become king? So that we could have everything that he had when he walked on the faith. Literally, every privilege, every right, every aspect, every jot, every tittle, every promise in this word that, that's in here, that, we, that everything in the kingdom of heaven that, that, was in the, that was in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus operated, that he had access to, we have access to it too. All, But it's not just in heaven, y'all. The, the Bible says, listen to this. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is where? Within us. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence. You've suffered violence in your life. But violence, you can take it by, because the kingdom of heaven is in you through the Holy Spirit. Violence, take it back by force. You can take it all back. You can take your families back. You can take your jobs back. You can take your finances back. You can take your mind back. You can take authority back in your life. You can take what's been stolen from you, David. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, I think it's 6, 6 around verse 31, it says that, that if the enemy comes to steal, he got to give back to you seven times what he took from you, even if it means his own house. 
You got something he don't got. You got a mansion. Y'all not even listening to me. You got a mansion laid up in heaven, already made in heaven for you. Did you know, I love with this one lady that used to live. Her name was Linda Quick. She said, she said someone she didn't know. It was so profound she didn't realize what she was saying. She said, she said, she said, Satan don't even have a home to live in. He don't. He don't. He, he don't want to be in hell. And when Jesus rose up out of the grave on the third day, what did he do with hell? What did he, what did he take, David? He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from, from, the, from, from Satan. Satan don't even have keys to his own house. You do. So why did Jesus do all this? So that you could have every, every, every power, every authority, mm -hmm. and, and all, the, all privileges, all rights to the kingdom of heaven. He established the kingdom of heaven here on earth so that all power would be given. So the same Holy Spirit that worked in him would work in you. That's what they were asking about. That's what they said. What did they say? What did they praise him for? They said the Bible said they praised him for all the mighty works that he had done. They, wanted to, they needed to see him in their life, didn't they? They need to see. And the Bible says that the, that the um, Pharisees said, Teacher, rebuke them for what they're saying. And he said, I tell you, if, you if, if they keep silent, this is, how, this is the power God wants you to have. If they keep silent, then even the rocks will cry out. Even the rocks will cry out and praise him. Even the trees of the field will clap their hands. You have the power. I've always said it. That God, that God can do anything and he can do anything in us and through us. He gives us the power to do so. He can make, if we can make a make an make an axe head swim, make a donkey talk, make a rooster crow to cause a man to repent and turn and turn around on and and and, and then forward it on the day of Pentecost, preach the most powerful message. That the Bible says that these men they they they, 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 they here's what you know what people miss it when I talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit day. You know what they miss it. We miss it so much in one little thing. Everybody talks about the gift of speaking in tongues. We get all jumbled up and worked. The devil lets you get all jumbled up and worked up over speaking in tongues. Did you know it's the least of all the gifts? In, the, in all the nine gifts of the Spirit, it's the least of them. Paul even says, I, I pray in tongues more than y'all. He says, but I'd rather you prophesy and I'd rather you speak words of knowledge and wisdom. Just tell people, just tell them flat out. That's why you don't hear me speaking in tongues a lot. Because I, because I, I just give you with, words of knowledge and prophecy and wisdom in here. But he said, but, but it's the initial evidence of what? Of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, and, and there's one gift there called the diversity of tongues. It's that that when, when you get the power, when you receive the power, the Bible said, they, they, the Bible said, the Bible talked to them when they came up in that upper room and they came out of there. It said that those men, when they came out, it said, these, these men have been with Jesus. All the men in the world were standing there. Diversity of tongues means what? I pray in a language that I don't even know not of. But, I, but it's a language that somebody else understands. It's somebody else's dialect. And they were prayed in all these different dialects and languages. That's what diversity of tongues is. And the Bible said that these men were sitting there listening to all these great men, all these theologians and very philosophers and all these men of great wisdom were listening to them. And all of a sudden, they, they said, these men have been with Jesus. Because they were, they were illiterate. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were people of no... Uh, no known uh, authority and education or wisdom. They said, how do you know? Because they speak the wonderful works of God. That's what they said. I'm about to close up. I'm about to close down. And so they, they, so Jesus was offering what? He was offering the same power. They, want, they, they said, they, they want the same mighty works that he was doing. That's what they wanted, Marilyn. They wanted... Jesus to do these mighty works as the king, what they saw him do. They wanted him to vanquish all of their enemies, to remove all of their enemies, to get rid of them. They've been in bondage for 400 years to the Roman government. And they wanted to destroy all their enemies and, and put all the nations under their feet. And so they would rule with Jesus. But Jesus wasn't going to do that, y'all. He, now, he vanquished all their enemies. But he didn't come to do what they thought he wanted to do. He didn't come to destroy mankind. What does it say in 2 Peter 3 and 9? God wishes that none would perish, but all, if I say all, all come to repentance. He didn't, just, he didn't come to destroy mankind. He came to lift him up. He came to draw. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father but by me. And Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came to what? Give life and give it to you more abundantly. 
So this is where. So he. So what he came to do was 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 through, by setting up his kingdom. Y'all stay with me just another ten minutes. What he came to do was, was was he came to set up his authority as a kingdom so that he could give you Wayne, he could give you Gina, he could give you Pam, he could give the entire world, everybody that followed Jesus, he could give them the same authority. He said. He said the same. He, he said the same. He sanctified them. He said the same glory that I, the Father gave me, I now give to them. And the way he established it, he was He didn't want to do signs and wonders and miracles for Maryland. He wanted to give it to them so they could operate in signs and wonders and miracles, so they could have the same authority that he did. Without rushing along, I feel like. So, so what is this called? It's called sanctification. The word sanctification means to what? It means to purify, to set apart, to anoint, to separate, to, to set aside for you. God, that's what God, he purified man. He purified his own remnant, special people, to make you zealous for all good works, to give you the same authority, the same glory, the same Holy Spirit that, that Jesus walked in, the same power, the same kingdom, the same might, the same, the same goodness, of the same attributes of God, but also the same voice of God, Austin, where you could actually begin to pray and people be delivered, be healed. I'm going to show you all that next week. I'll give you a little nut. Will you be like Peter? And all of a sudden, you, when the whole people get healed, they lay people on the sidewalk, y'all. And then his shadow was cast. Just his shadow hit on them and they were healed. Just a, just a shadow from the sun. And those three, the, the two types of saints, one's sanctification, one's instantaneous. And I've already told you a little bit about it. And the other one's, the other one's progressive. The instantaneous was what? The baptism of Christ. Everybody, had to, everybody has to go through what? The way of the cross. When you go through the way of the cross, then you're baptized in Christ. You get a, you're instantaneously made brand new through what? Through the blood of Jesus. You're cleansed of all unrighteousness. I'm going to speed it up since I told you a little bit about it earlier. You're, you're, you're washed and you're made clean through the, through the, through the blood of Jesus. And, and then the veil is what? The veil is torn. And when the veil was torn, the veil was torn, the flesh was separated. And as the flesh was separated, as you were washed clean and through the blood of Jesus, I didn't tell you this part, as you were washed clean through the blood of Jesus, and all your sins were forgiven you, and all your sins were cast as far as the east is from the west, and to see a forgiveness, Gina, then, the, then, what it, then you get, I told you this part, then you get the embodiment of God. Why? So that when you stand before God, He didn't see you how you He didn't see you in your corrupt. You get the body of God through what? The body of Christ, the baptism of Christ. You 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 walk. You get the you get the the veil. The new veil becomes Jesus' body's flesh because it was without sin. So when you stand before God now, He doesn't see your your corrupt nature. He doesn't see your corrupt flesh. He doesn't see how you were. He sees how you can be. Through the blood of his son and through the body embodiment of his son. And you stand what? You stand holy in the presence of God. You stand holy in God's glory. You stand holy in God's majesty. And you can actually, not only can you walk with him in the cool of the day, but he can, David, he can walk in you and through you and around you. And you can say in him, do I live and move and have my being. Now the holiness of God is in you. But see, that's not enough. That's the first baptism. That's where people stop. They stop at the cross. They stop at the. They stop at the. They, they stop when the story had ended. When there's another stage, another process. Now you're born again, and now you're made brand new. Now you're without sin. But you need to do what? You need to be able to deflect. You need to be able to overcome sin, don't you? You need to be able to overcome the attacks of your enemies. You need to be able to overcome the attacks of wickedness and darkness. You need to be able to overcome the cares of life, the temptations of the world. Titus 2 says this, that, the, that, the, that the, the grace of God, the, which is the Holy Spirit, that the grace of God that brought us salvation comes to us and he teaches us what? How to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. How to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present day. So there's a second, there's a second baptism. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The embodiment of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the, what is, that's the second act of grace. That's the, that is the progressive act of grace. So then, so as the first one, Jesus did with us. We, but we were there on the cross. We died with him. When he nailed, when he nailed that this his flesh was nailed to the cross. Guess what, Gina? Your flesh was nailed along with his. You died on the cross with him, and you rose again on the third day with him. 
and you were victorious through the power of the Holy Spirit. Your flesh was torn, and you were made brand new in Christ. You, you, you were buried with him in death, and you were resurrected in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the most important thing that needs to be known in this is the second act of sanctification, which is the second, which is the, the second baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now that you are now that you are made brand new in Christ, you need to, you need you need protection. You need to be you need to be in the fulfillment, the fullness of God. How through the Holy Ghost? How do you do that? By the by being by the Holy Ghost. Not only bat, He comes with three things: fire, fire. Come on, Holy Ghost, fire, and the uh, redemption and the power. Fire, the glory, and the power. Fire, the glory, and the power. Fire, the fire comes just like the, what did the blood of Jesus do? Cleanse you of all unrighteousness, right? Now, what's the only thing left? What's not? What's what's what, when you get born again? What's cleansed through the blood of Jesus? I, I repeat myself. I know your soul and your spirit, right? What's not cleansed? Your body. So now your body needs to be purified so you can actually be whole, spirit, soul, and body. So the fire comes, and, it, and, and the cloven tongues of fire, God purifies the body and makes it what? The temple. The temple of the Holy Ghost. The, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, the, the glory is what? The embodiment of God. The Holy. Now, Jesus wrapped himself around you so you could stand before the Father without sin. But now the Holy Ghost does what? Wraps himself around you so that what? So that you can deflect sickness, sickness and disease. So that you can, so that you can rebuke the devourer for your sake. So you can have this, the kingdom principles. So that you can take authority over forces of darkness. So you can rebuke your enemies. So that when the, the attacks of the world come against you, when the devil tries to come in like a flood, and he tries to, and he tries to uh, burn your house down, you can stamp out the forest fires. You can stamp out the authority of the, the enemy. You can stamp out the wickedness in high places. You can, you can speak to sickness and darkness. You can, you can walk in. You can call, You can rebuke darkness, and it'll flee. You can actually cast off, you can actually lay hands on, this, on, on your family members and, and sickness will never be in your house. Your whole household can be delivered from the bondage of sin and death. Oh, you're not listening. Your whole household can be delivered from the bondage of sin and death. And everybody can be transformed and changed just because you are, did you know that you're, that you, that by you being sanctified, by you being made holy through the whole, by, by the holy, the word baptism means to be immersed. You're not, now you're not just, not just, if you if you've been baptized, how many's been baptized in water? Hold your hand. If you ever been baptized in water, you know that means to go down under, right? That's an example of, of being born again in Christ. But the but the but but that means Christ dwells on the inside. And now the whole, now you're in field. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, aren't you? But when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're not just filled. When you actually go under and you come back up and look at me, y'all, you're immersed in the. Now the Holy Ghost is not just in you. He's around you and through you and above you and before you and all over you. So that what? So now you're walking in the exact same power and dominion that Jesus walked on the face of the earth. And I'm going to show you next week that Jesus didn't cheat. He didn't cheat. He didn't exempt himself from the same process. He went through the exact same, the, the exact same form of sanctification, the exact same two, two of uh, two baptisms. Baptism of Christ, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus went through both of them, just in a different way. So now that you are baptized in Christ today, now that you are, now that you, that you are open to that, con to, to God, to the Holy Spirit pouring Himself out on you, that you know we can all be one. Not only can we, not only can we be one with God, <coughs> so that you may be one with the Father and I. But you know what, Marilyn? You know that you and I can be one. We can all, we all be in one mind, and one accord, walking in perfect. And, 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 and no weapons formed against any of our families, the church, anything, everything around us would walk in, in, walk in a heavenly, a heavenly anointing all the time. I hope y'all are getting this. A heavenly power all the time that, that everywhere you went, you'd be blessed. Everywhere you went, the glory of God would be, would follow you and be around you. People's lives would be changed around you. you, you you'd find favor everywhere you went. You, you, would, you would prosper, not just financially, not just physically, not just materially, but spiritually. And everything you did, everywhere you went, light would go and darkness would flee. How would you like to walk like that? That everywhere, that even the demons itself, when, like Jesus, when you walk, even the demons itself, when, when they seen you coming, they'd say, why have you come to torment us before our time? Believe it or not, sickness and disease knows who people who are, who are anointed under the glory of God. People, sickness and disease knows 
people who are walking in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, those who aren't. Because when you're walking in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, everything just deflects off of you. Everything just bounces off of you. Why? Because the glory of the Lord is surrounding you. The authority of God. And it bounces off your family too. Wayne, it it's not just for you. When you're sanctified, did you know this? Even your loved ones that are lost, your, your, the anointing on you sanctifies them. I can prove that to you in Romans chapter 7. It sanctifies them and keeps them until God can, can reach them and, 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 and win them over. So that none of your none of your loved ones will be lost. None of them. None of them will be harmed. I'm talking about a glory, y'all, if we ever get into this, if we ever see that, that, that most people leave the best part out. That, that, that I'm, I take that back. I'm close. Most people leave the best part out. I know that your salvation is the most important part. But to keep your salvation, to keep your redemption, you also got to keep yourself, don't you? You also got to you also got to be empowered by the Holy Ghost to rise up above everything. And if you can, once the Holy Ghost starts working inside of you, and, and we're all we're all walking in it together, you'll see signs and wonders that you have never seen in your life. You won't. I know y'all ready to go. But you know what? You'll start seeing things happen. You won't ever want to leave, Austin. You'll never want to leave the house of God once you start seeing things He's doing. Once you start seeing the miraculous, and, and you start seeing God change your life, you'll go, oh, oh. I want all. I want more of this. You start crying like they did. Let us. You start praising God for the mighty works in your life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Heavenly Father, I just lift them up right now in Jesus' name. Let this word go forth and not come back void. Let it accomplish, Lord, what you have said it to do. Let it be your your power, your authority in this place today. And I just I release it. I release your word over them, and I release the anointing over. And by your stripes, Lord, their family, their homes are healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah.